In the heart of Latvia's capital, Riga, there's a memorial to freedom. It's a place to remember resistance to oppression. The Russians, the Nazis, and then the Russians as the Soviet Union all controlled this Baltic country over the past century. But the Soviets were here the longest, five decades, and at times their rule was brutal. So these doors are specifically built by the KGB. Uh, it's a garage door where trucks would back in and the bodies that were executed in the chamber in here would have, would have been wrapped up and then dumped into the truck to be taken away. Aya Abins is showing us the old Riga headquarters of the Soviet secret police, the feared KGB. This was the execution room. It's a very small room, um, yes, and it was uh, purposefully built. It was soundproofed and had rubberized fabric put around uh, the walls to be able to clean up. Uh, more, uh, more easily. Anyone seen as a threat to Soviet ideology in any way could end up here. 186 people were shot in this room over a six month period in 1941. So this is what we call the exercise yard. Abbins is a coordinator at the museum. She's also a Canadian. She taught history in Toronto for 20 years before returning to Latvia after it regained its independence in 1990. Some people uh, prefer not to remember this place because it may, be, may remind them of horrible memories that people just don't want to remember. Abbins has made it her job to ensure Latvians don't forget their past, especially with all that's happening now. Russia! In 2014, Russia took back Crimea from Ukraine, which most of the world saw as illegal. Its military also intervened in eastern Ukraine, moves that created anxiety in the Baltics over Russia once again. So, Latvia called on NATO for help. 450 Canadian troops arrived over the summer, and set up a base outside of Riga. You know, with, with what happened in uh, 2014, with the you know, aggressive actions of Russia and Crimea, Ukraine, you know, the, the heads of state of, of NATO nations decided to actually put soldiers on the ground, which is, I think, the most clear message you could send, that uh, we are committed together as an alliance to, to defend uh, ourselves and our allies. The Canadians, though, have arrived in a country still divided over Russia, and its role in Latvia's past. Canada's Latvian hosts have a complicated relationship with Russia. More than a third of the country speaks Russian and has Russian loyalties. And there's no consensus here on what to call that long period of Soviet rule. Most do call it an occupation, but many others prefer more benign terms, such as incorporation. First prisoners were brought here in uh, November of 1940. For Aya Abbins, there is no ambiguity. This place was packed. Uh, cells that are meant for one person or two people often had six and seven people in it. The KGB building is now preserved as part of what's called the Museum of Occupation. It was clearly an occupation when it began. Uh, the Soviets came in 1940 saying that they were liberating Latvians from the bourgeois government. And then they returned in 1944 to say that they were liberating Latvia from uh, Nazi occupiers. Liberators usually go home. They never went home. Since Crimea, there's been a noticeable ramping up of occasions remembering those dark Soviet times. This ceremony paid tribute to the victims of one of Stalin's most egregious crimes, the deportation of 15,000 Latvians to Siberia in 1941. Those horrors are depicted in a powerful new film. The Chronicles of Melanie tells the true story of a Latvian woman in 1941, transported thousands of kilometers by train and then sent off into the wilderness. It portrays appalling conditions that the deportees lived in and the women's fight to avoid starvation and death. It was a nightmarish experience that Dinah Gurkha lived through herself. Now 88 years old, her memories of having her life ripped apart are incredibly sharp. 
I'm afraid even now of Russia, she says, because they think Latvia is theirs. In 1941, when the Soviets moved into Latvia, Gerka was 11 years old. Her father, an influential businessman, was on the local city council, and that fact alone made him a potential threat to Stalin's regime. We were given two hours to pack and to bring as much as we could carry. Her siblings and mother were separated from their father and sent thousands of kilometers from home. They were left to fend for themselves in a collective farm that could barely grow anything. Her father was shot. Gurkha says her mother starved to death so that her children could eat her meager food rations. My mother died in the second winter. We lived because we were brought to an orphanage. At an orphanage, Gerka says she got enough food to survive, and in 1946 she returned to Latvia. Now she says she tells her story, hoping that Latvia will never experience a Russian occupation again. Unfortunately, you cannot rely on Russians. You can't trust what they say. Ethnic Latvians make up two-thirds of this country's population, and Russia as an occupier is how most people see it. But lots of ethnic Russians live here too, and Russian media and culture influences everything. This is Yarmala, a stunning beachside community about 45 minutes outside of Riga on the Baltic. In Soviet times, it was a favorite holiday destination for Moscow's elite. It remains popular with Latvia's ethnic Russian population. People such as Gennady Kashko. Well, what is an occupation, really? Latvia was one of the Soviet republics that actually lived very well. People considered it to be practically like being in a foreign country. They were worse off in Russia than Latvia. So if it was an occupation, it should have been worse here, right? Not the opposite. We spoke to elders Nagivs and his friends, who are Russian-speaking Latvians. He told us while many believe the Soviet era was repressive, he does not. Now NATO is here. Well, this is in its own way a type of occupation. People from another country with their army come to your land and start to dictate how to do things. So maybe in 90 years they will call this an occupation too. And he offered this insight into Canada's role here. In Canada, it's much simpler. It's independent. It's been on its own a long time. It's in a territory no one is planning to occupy. It just cooperates with the U.S. and that's good for them, and it sends off its army. But if Canada wanted troops to come from France or Latvia, well, I don't think the people of Canada would look at this positively. Здравствуйте. Я русский оккупант. Это моя профессия. Так сложилось исторически. Russia is eager to exploit the divisions in Latvia and to destabilize the NATO mission. Да, я оккупант. This video is a sophisticated propaganda effort. The sarcastic voice states that Russia occupied the Baltic countries and then built power plants, factories, and created luxuries for those who lived here. But after the Russians left, it says many Latvians now clean toilets for other Europeans. Европе. In Latvia, such thoughts have found an attentive audience. Mr. President, uh, hello. my name is Chris Brown. I'm with the Canadian Broadcasting yeah. Corporation. All the more reason Latvia's President Raimonds Fionis told us to have Canadians here. It is important that uh, Canadian troops and also other troops uh, of uh, NATO forces uh, will send a very strong signal uh, to our society that uh, we are not alone, we are together with our friends. And secondly, it will be a very strong signal to our neighbor uh, that uh, we are ready for everything. In the old KGB building, there's a book. 
and it contains the names of tens of thousands of Latvians arrested or deported by the Soviets. That is my grandfather's brother. The names of some of Aya Abin's relatives are in there. For her, the discussion over how to characterize Russia's rule is deeply personal. Nature does this for us. They, it makes us forget the terrible things that have happened in our life. And there are some people who are nostalgic for the Soviet era, but uh, they certainly weren't the people who spent any time here. The steel doors and razor wire here represent the worst of the Soviet experience in Latvia. But whether it's the way Latvians should see Russia now continues to divide this place. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Riga, Latvia.